And lots of folks are trying to run before they can walk. When they're crawling, they should be just aiming to be walking. So walking in marketing terms is optimizing the messaging, the positioning, the targeting, tactics, the tactical mix, budgets. There's lots of things. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Ricepreneur podcast, a show dedicated to all the entrepreneurs and business owners out there who's looking to grow, scale their businesses, increase valuation, and ultimately exit. Today, we have a guest, a special guest, who is a serial entrepreneur himself. He is also a growth leadership advisor and a business coach. His name is Noah Koff. Noah, say hi. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to pick your brain and see your perspective from your journey uh, on the business and the scaling and growth. So I know you started as a UX, being a more on the technician side. How did you transition into entrepreneurship? Oh, wow. Well, I'm on my third business today as a solo, and it's been seven years that I've been building my current business. Very first business was when I was in my 20s, actually, living in London. And I had an opportunity to build a record label music business, which made record, you know, vinyl. And we also had a publishing business and licensed our recordings to compilations. And my partner handled the artist relationships. He's a music publisher. And my background in marketing and operations meant that I ran that side of the business. And our third partner was providing the capital. And so we released close to 20 different projects. And that was when I really cut my teeth in business and selling products, marketing products, capitalizing a business, raising money, managing different stakeholders, reaching profitability, and having fun with turning a dream into reality. So what triggered you to go into business? I mean, saying no to a paycheck, not everybody can do it. That first business for me was a side project. I had a paycheck as an executive of an ad agency. That was my day job. And this was a side project. And I had this opportunity to do this. And it was actually an old colleague's vision that he came to me with. He wanted to do the project and he had the money and he pitched me and I was very interested. So we did it and turned it into a success. And that gave me confidence that I could bring this skill set to other types of businesses, service businesses, and other product businesses. Mm -hmm. and so would you say uh, marketing and technology gave you that confidence to go in into that side gig and actually bother with it? Yeah, really what gave me the confidence was that there was a low, it was a low risk situation because ultimately we weren't pressured in order to turn a profit immediately. And we took a slower road, multiple years to turn the business into a profitable situation and didn't need tons of capital because it was a side project. So it was an ideal way to learn about running and, you know, the nuts and bolts of a small business. And we had an accountant, we had a distributor, we had a PR supplier. So all of the nuts and bolts were there. And we raised a little over a hundred thousand dollars and we were able to pay that money back to our investor, which was fantastic. So it was a great learning opportunity when I was in my twenties, before I had kids, before I had a mortgage to pay, before there was real pressure and it was that type of a company. In my second business, it was my full-time thing. And that was a mobile marketing agency, a service business. And the stakes were higher because I had mouths to feed, kids, 
a mortgage and big clients that I worked with like Red Bull and Google to help them with their strategy and execution of marketing of mobile projects. And this was in 2007, eight, nine, and in those years in London. So that was my second business. And again, applying the principles and some of the foundations from the earlier business, but you know, 10 years into the future. And that was business number two. And now you on the third venture. Right. And these days, as a solo entrepreneur, I'm building towards a $2 million business. The focus is helping mid-sized businesses with their growth roadmap. And people hire me who have a goal that feels impossible to them. They're already successful, confident people, and they're already having momentum with their business and they need that clarity and they need that support to turn that dream that they have that goal into reality. And that's what they hire me for. And I've been working with professional athletes and media company executives and serial entrepreneurs, both B2B brands and also consumer product businesses. Awesome. So no, let me ask you this, learning about the future, knowing what to expect inspires some at the same time, an idea of what to watch out for and what to look towards. In your experience, you experience a startup phase, you've been with other businesses where you took it to, to the next level, now working with the mid-size to enterprise. What should be the primary focus of each stage and where the stages actually shift, right? Like as a startup. That's where primary focus should be. And when you go beyond certain benchmark, your focus should shift and focus more on uh, that aspect of the business. Can you walk us through that journey and what currently mid-sized businesses are facing and what do they need to do to get to that enterprise level? Yeah. So it's completely custom and different for each one of my customers and what we do together is that I meet them where they are, exactly where they are. And together we understand what's working and what's not working for the foundational strategy. And the different aspects of this are a foundation looks like understanding the ideal customer, the message, the offer. And then also your infrastructure to be able to execute that strategy. And some of that is your people. Some of that is your process. And another aspect is the technology and tool. So in the first week, I'm able to quickly audit and assess what we have, where the gaps are, and then we can get focused together on a quick wins plan for the coming 30, 60, 90 days to make progress against the, and to impact the sub goals underneath that big goal, which is revenue, customers that we're going to acquire, profits, or whatever specific metrics make sense for this business model. And I've worked with both B2B and B2C. So depending on the business model, we get focused in on those metrics. We implement dashboards. They don't have that. I help implement EOS, the entrepreneur's operating system, which are frameworks and tools that help businesses mature from where they are to where they want to go. When I first learned how to implement an entrepreneur operating system, it was really powerful for me because I quickly understood how the best performing businesses are able to impact their goals and have steady progress. And it, it is not reinventing the wheel. It's using frameworks and tools that already exist and learning the ropes with these tools and techniques. And it was really powerful for me when I first worked with a business coach on a big hairy goal that I didn't think was possible, which was to create a roadmap to triple our business and to break through 400K months and have that steadily happening. And it was through doing this work and leading my team that we did that and had a breakthrough quarter and 
The rest is history for me. I've been a big advocate of EOS and systems and tools and frameworks that help you build steady revenue months ahead of schedule. And those are some of the te the techniques and approaches that I help my clients with. Just to be sure that the audience is aware, the EOS tools by Gino Wickman, one of the famous books by him is Traction. There, the concepts are touched on, of course, on a much deeper level, one needs to understand how to leverage those tools. So you, using yeah. their system, their frameworks, were able to get companies to that next level. I use a different one, which is called scale, the Scaling Up and the Gazelles yeah. frameworks. But yes, those are the two most popular ones out there today. And there are others as well, but it doesn't really matter which one you use. The most important thing is that you find frameworks, you commit, you do the work, and you stay with the process and keep going with it. Yeah, the foundations are the same. Just need somebody to come in from outside who's not too close, not too emotionally attached to things exactly. that are going on to give you that fresh perspective and then again, by trusting the process, things just work out ultimately. Of course, yeah. not easy, right? If it was easy, everybody would do it. But you need someone to be a mentor, a guy that would hold your hand to go through it. Exactly. So let me ask you this. Is every client, I don't know, it's going to be, again, probably too general. In your experience, every client that you touch on, is this where you start uh, with on a, on a marketing side? Okay, let's look at the, your product offer, who's your segment? how you position your offer, what distribution channels you use and so on, or you step back and approach it some other way. I start with an audit or assessment with all of my clients because I've found that's the fastest way for me to download all the critical data and on deeper understanding of performance for this business today. That's the snapshot or baseline of what's going on underneath the hood. And just like a doctor would, you know, look at your vital statistics to understand the health of the patient before they determine what's wrong and what we need to fix on. So I approach things similarly. It, it is a process and I found that that's the most efficient way to prioritize what we need to focus in on for the coming 30 days, 60 and 90 days. And that really helps us together. I'll discuss and align on the sub goals underneath, you know, their big goal. So the easy part is agreeing that we want to double this business or triple this business during a period of time, right? That's mm -hmm. super easy. But underneath that, what are those sub goals? And that's really what the audit and assessment and downloading data and doing that analysis. I use benchmarks to help my clients quickly understand how they measure up against growth companies that I've worked with. And that helps us get on the same page about the gaps and the resources that we need and the targeted investments of current resources and new resources that we need to make in order to move the needle and start making progress week over week, month over month, and then over the, the period of the year. And that really helps us step up from where the client is now to where they want to be. So yeah, the, the audit and the assessment is the beginning piece. The structure and rigor comes from working with the big sophisticated companies that really demand the structure and they are looking for clarity on where we're headed. You know, what does the map look like? And if you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars a week, you know, in some cases, investing multiple millions of dollars a month, you need to have that rigor and that clear map. So all of my approach comes from working with big, sophisticated Fortune 500 companies that I've personally sold to, and I tailor the same type of approaches for smaller businesses can benefit from having that structure and discipline. Can you describe without going into too many details what that assessment looks like? What some of the questions that you ask and what type of answers are you typically getting before you get started? Maybe a couple of yeah. examples for people to get an idea. Yeah, sure. So initially, the first question always is, where do you want to be in 12 months time? What does that look like? And is it only know, so on, that... like on the financial side? What exactly do you mean by that in the next 12 months? 
Well, for the leader of the company, leaders understanding the financial performance is one dimension, but then underneath that is, you know, what is the goal behind that? And one of my clients shared with me, once we unpacked their situation, we really understood was this person wanted to have more time with their family, more time for his passion, which is spending time in nature and, and bird watching and spending time on the lake. That is why he wanted to have this big outcome in a year's time. It was to spend more time with his family on the lake. And so we need to understand the full picture, the financial performance, but what is also the dream that this person has that we need to create? It's often more than the money, you know, and so I'm not a therapist, but I am here to ask those questions to uncover the goals behind the goal. And that helps people clarify their higher purpose on this mission. And that's a very important part of getting clear and creating the roadmap to a goal is clarifying that higher purpose for the business and also for this person or this team of people's life outside of the business. Having both of those and being clear on those and through repetition, continuing to clarify those goals and dreams and higher purpose in life is all part of it. So, yeah. What, so what, we, are, the, what so are the top started, three, what are top three non-financial issues they're looking to solve? Like in this example, you brought that they wanted to be more with their family and their lake house. What other yeah. things are you hearing? Yeah. More time off, less weekend and evening work, more abundance of time. So that is really consistent across every founder that I talk to and work with is really having more time back. And a third thing is clarity on the next chapter of their life. If they're working towards an exit or a big outcome, what are they going to use the proceeds for? And really starting to get specific about that next chapter. What does that look like? And how can we create that together? So that is a third thing. Those tend to be the big themes that come up. Time, the next thing, the next chapter. And I would also say improving relationships in their life with their business partners, could be with investors, could be at home as well. Those tend to be themes that come up in my work. One might think that getting to mid-level before even enterprise, you would have all the time opened up, right? The reason entrepreneurs think of a business, it's freedom, toiling, right. going through all those stages as a startup, a small business, and so on, ultimately delegating everything out. One would think that you have your time opened up. So it sounds like whether you're at the startup level or next level, you still kind of consumed by the business. Yeah, that's right. You are consumed by the business until you're able to get better at communication and delegation and repetition of the systems so that you can replace yourself and spend more time on strategy and the high value activities and delegate the lower value, lower impact activities. Too often people are spending time on admin work or things that they need to delegate or chasing after shiny objects that are really not going to move the needle for them this week, this month, this quarter. It's really common that people avoid and distract themselves from the important work that their business needs them to do, whether that's sales and outreach or raising money and financing. These are the things that are easy to avoid because they could be uncomfortable and, mm -hmm. you know, and you could be not feeling confident or there's some type of a block, something's blocked. And that seeing those blocks is something that someone from the outside can be very helpful with. And this is something that my clients tell me that they really appreciate that I'm able to help them see these blind spots from new perspective and help them to get unblocked in these specific areas so that they can get the right things done that are important right now in service and to impact 
their big goal and what they dream that they will have this season. So that's why this work is so important. And that's why having a wing man or wing person can be really valuable. So when you go through that assessment, you identify where they want to be, mm-hmm. then evaluating more, you see where they are, you see the gap, you come up with a yeah. strategy, how you're going to close the gap and you go into implementation mode. Right. How the implementation works out. Yeah. You said that there's a mm-hmm. 30, 60, 90 day milestones that you set, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I assume you would reverse engineer everything and then start mm-hmm. uh, working your way up. What type of challenges you see as something for someone to adopt the change, right? Again, I want to assume that besides a business owner himself, there's other people involved, so like management, mm-hmm. actual specialists. Where do you see the resistance of implementation of the plan? Like why not for someone just to right. sit down, create their own plan and follow through? Why do they need that accountability, guidance, mm-hmm. and mentorship in place? Oh yeah, totally. Well, it's different for every single person, but some of the themes that come up are just getting distracted with shiny objects. So let's say our focus right now is generating sales and doing outreach and bringing new customers into our pipeline. And if you are avoiding doing that work that you need to do every day, you know, driving your truck is one way of looking at it. You know, the truck driver gets into the truck and drives every day, irrespective of whether they are feeling like they want to drive that day. You may wake up and say, I don't feel like generating sales today. I don't feel like reaching out doing sales meetings, or I don't feel like reaching out to investors to pitch for the money that my business needs this season. So feelings get in the way, shiny objects get in the way, distractions. You may gravitate towards something that you love doing, which could be coming up with a new idea for a product and creating more product pipeline. That's different from the thing that your business needs you to do, which is pitching investors or getting in front of clients or prospects and doing deals or making that important hire. So we all gravitate from the things that we need to do to the things that sometimes we want to to do. And that's where I can help, you know, with some accountability, with shining the spotlight on the things that your business needs you to do. And that's really how week over week, we make progress, we move the needle, and that's hugely important. So that's one theme that comes up a lot. Feelings, distractions. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, yeah, I see see this also as a common phenomena where founders, they usually more extroverted not necessarily detail oriented. So for them to work on processes systems, it's a torture. They like variety. They don't want to be positioned into a box and do the same thing every day. They need variety. So that's where the shiny objects come in, right? So I see that as well. So they, I guess, not realizing their own nature, they attempt to do it themselves. And every time, of course, they do not produce results as someone who would be task-oriented, detail-oriented, and wants that day-to-day. They don't want variety. They want, I want to come to work. I know what is expected. I'm going to execute. Again, whether I'm a specialist or the manager, it's a routine work. I like routines, right? So founders are not necessarily in those shoes, and that's why they get easily distracted and they judge Uh themselves too much. Yeah, and ideas people and visionary people, and I work with a lot of those types of people, They will solve a problem with a new idea that then needs to be executed without following through and executing the thing that needs to be executed and followed through with. So those are the types of patterns that can get in the way of good execution. And then great execution has to do with, yeah, those systems and processes running smooth and strong, being better at delegating and clear communication, training people, setting them for success, being very clear about their roles and the outcomes that they need to create. And that's cultural, setting people up for success. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is just continuing to run it and just, you know, consistency. And it's boring, but that's what works. Doing the work, work, 
keeping it all running works. And that's how you can have the abundance you want that your business needs as well. Do you position yourself as an integrator or just a guide when uh, you as work a, with your clients? Yeah, as a guide and integrating systems, tools, people is part of it. So absolutely. I know that folks that have strong backgrounds in operations use that positioning. I don't use that so much. But if people are looking for integration of process, of people, of tools, that's all part of it. That's part of what you get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Can we then uh, shift to the growth side, right? So you identified, uh, and again, your specialty in uh, marketing. Uh, yes, you're familiar with everything, but on a deeper level, the marketing, the growth is uh, where you position. So. Can you describe what your blueprint or your methodology is, uh, just like you did uh, with the goals and uh, find identifying the gap? So from the marketing point of view, it starts really with positioning of a brand. And that's part of the foundation. In order to have a strong foundation in marketing, you have to have a very clear positioning. And what that means is being focused on who the ideal customer is, why they should care about your service or product, and what this is. So who, what, and why. And being very clear and concise and getting that positioning is craft. Without it, you can't sell effectively. So that is a real key part of the positioning of this brand, of this business. And part of that is, is also your offer. So, you know, the, this offer, how much does it cost? What do you get? So the, there's a stack here of your positioning statement of the offer of the pricing, and that all needs to be thought through. And where I start my process with is in research. And some of my clients have current data about their customers and their category. In other cases, there are gaps to fill. And in the first several weeks of our engagement, we quickly get data and make it actionable so that we can make good decisions about the positioning and fine tuning it. And once we have our positioning, then we can convert it into messaging that we can test and A-B test messaging on websites and emails and ads, and that helps us move conversion rates, which is just, you know, how many people who arrive at your shop buy, that's your conversion ratio. So we want to move it from X to Y. I help my clients with benchmarks to understand their conversion ratio today and then where it needs to be. And that's part of our growth roadmap is moving conversion so that the numbers work to move revenue, profits, lifetime value, whatever the metric is that makes sense for this business model. So, so yeah, go ahead. I'm Sorry. big on, I'm big on the dashboard as a way to measure performance for the programs and for the campaigns and for the tactics and in our, as part of our assessment, we plug our goals and sub goals into dashboards so that every week we can measure the funnel and measure our actions so we understand how it's going and are we closing the gap where do we need to pick up the pace and this is really all about driving performance is yeah having that tool having those practices of a weekly review with the team and stakeholders to make decisions to move the needle and what investments do we need to make in order to pick up the pace? What's not working? Where, what pivots do we need to make? And this is really all part of the practice, the growth practice of driving performance and goal achievement. So yes, marketing is part of performance for goal achievement and the foundation has to start with your positioning and clarity on the customer behavior, the category behavior, those insights. Yeah. I come at it from a research point of view. I'm a hands-on researcher and a writer. So I help with the data analysis, running the surveys, running the research studies, 
translating that into insights. And then we need to translate those insights into messages for testing. And I bring a background as a writer so I can help my clients fine tune their messaging to get that to work. So yeah, that's the foundation in, in the marketing and the data analysis and the research. And those are some of our building blocks that help us get our foundation really solid because you can't, and this is something I run into, lots of folks are trying to run before they can walk. When they're crawling, they should be just aiming to be walking. So walking in marketing terms is optimizing the messaging, the positioning, the targeting, the tactics, the tactical mix, budgets. There's lots of things, but we get those optimized and that gives us a strong foundation to be able to then build from. And that's, that's really what the first 30 to 60 days looks like is getting our foundation solid, getting baseline data where we don't have it, filling in gaps with research and insights, standing up new tactics, um, getting new data and starting to understand the unit economics to acquire new customer. Is it 70 or $80? Is it $5? Like, what is it given your category, given the market today, given the tactic and the channel that we're using to acquire our customer? Let's give some hands on uh, to the audience as an example, just to show them what what's possible, right? So I'm, I'm going to ask you some things on the, because it's not a startup. They already have transactions going on. My assumption also, it's not their first year in business. So they already have data, right? You can see a number of transactions, average transaction price. You see the lifetime value. You can see the churn rate if there's a subscription. So you kind of are getting an idea here. What are the some things that you can do? I'll just throw in one example and then you'll feel free to take it from there. One of the common things I see as a mistake business owners do is they treat all the customers the same, right? So we need to realize that somebody who is uh, purchasing from you monthly cannot be treated the same as somebody who just purchased once, right? right. So right. you, so one of the techniques could be that I'm going to go and segment my customers into A, B, C categories, right? Mm -hmm. And figure out for each of the core uh, categories, what's my, like you said, uh, ideal customer is, right? And right. from there, what, why, right? So that's where you would take them. So do you do something like right. that? And maybe you can mention a couple of other things somebody can do in their business today, right now, where they can right away see the benefit of breaking it down, identifying, narrowing down, clearing the message so it's not like noise. So you're talking directly to that type of customer and so on. What are some of the techniques that on your end you're using that somebody can just use it today if they choose to? I'm a big believer in 80-20 thinking, which says that 80% of your profits are going to come from 20% of your highest value customers. And I see those trends across multiple accounts and business models. 80-20 thinking, it's an old study. It goes back you know, hundreds of years and there's some fantastic books and frameworks that you can apply in your business. Richard Koch, K-O-C-H, has a great book about 80-20 thinking that I'd recommend you start with. And absolutely, you need to look at your list of customers and look at the top 20% most valuable customers and you know, who, what are the trends and attributes, not so much demographics, but behavior wise, what are some of the commonalities within the top 20% group? And that will help you build an ideal customer profile. So again, it's more than just age, gender, geography. It's like, what are the preferences? What are the pain points that this top most valuable group of customers that spend, you know, and don't churn. What are those preferences? What are those pain points? And the way that you understand that is through research. That's the most efficient way to get those insights is to have a research practice and to regularly 
get close to your customers, to get that data, to get those insights. And you want to look at it both from your existing customers today, and you also want to go outside of your existing customers to get data and insights from people who are considering your category, but aren't current customers. Mm -hmm. That helps you understand the prospects point of view and some of the barriers that may exist that you and your team need to address both on the product side and also on the marketing side. So it's important to have both sides, the customer today, the customer tomorrow, and that helps you sharpen your message, your positioning, and your execution. Yeah. When you said the researching on the inside, and it's not just demographics, right? Do you go as far as picking up the phone and actually calling them and asking them, why us? What makes you to keep coming back to us and do business with us? Of course, while we appreciate everything that they're doing, show them that appreciation. Do you actually go and get in touch with them to identify, you said, surveys? Is it just through writing or you actually pick up the phone and call? With all of my clients, it's a little bit different because it depends on the business. Some of my clients, for example, run events. So we're able to get in front of clients at events and hear their feedback and get insights in person. That's always going to be a great addition to a survey. Surveys just tend to be faster. You can do them higher volume, lower cost at speed. So I prefer surveys. And then on top of that, the face-to-face -face work is always going to be great in addition to that. So it's really a mix of things and there's no cookie cutter. It depends. The creativity is in understanding the client's business, their customer, and how to best get those insights uh, with what you've got. So it is a creative process. The first part is writing a research brief. What, how are, what data do we need? What decision are we trying to make with this data? And then understanding what a research technique is going to help us get that data. That's how it works for me. That's how I approach it. You know, write the brief and go through that process. And then you can, you always have options and there's always going to be trade-offs. So ma making those trade-offs and getting everyone on the same page, moving in the same direction about why we're doing a focus group versus a survey or calling people. So that's an important thing is just really understanding the benefits analysis and making a good decision there. Yeah. Yeah, and can we mention how that impacts the actual marketing strategy? Because now you uh, identified your ideal customer, you know exactly the pain and the tolerance, uh, you uh -huh. adjust your offer to that talks exactly to that audience, how that improves marketing campaigns in terms of click-through rate, the lead generation, uh -huh. making those leads targeted and making it easy for salespeople to close those. Right. So often the insight from the research is the key thing that you need in order to adapt your targeting. So who you're targeting with this campaign, which could be organic or paid, but you do need a list of people that you're going to reach out to and, and reach with your message. So targeting message and then offer. All three of those things you're going to want to fine tune based on the data that you get from your research. So you don't want to skip that step. The other reason why I do lots of surveys is because often my clients, they want to be marketing, you know, next week. So we got to move quickly and surveys, you can operationalize quickly, whereas doing lots of phone calls and running in an event or a focus group, it just takes longer. So. There's a lot of decisions that need to make, be made based on the timeline, based on the constraints of when we need to be in market selling and the resources that we have to do the research. So these are all factored into the right approach to research. And that really helps us fine tune the positioning and the offer stack and our go-to-market or campaign. And yeah, that's what it looks like. Can you share before and after anything that comes to mind, like 
without again revealing the company's name if you don't have to here's where i found them after making these adjustments that's the change that was impacting the click-through rate cost per lead cost per sale yeah sure so i do a lot of work with direct-to-consumer brands e-commerce brands that are selling products physical and digital products and by and large Conversion rates tend to be about 1% when people start working with me. So one out of every hundred visitors to their Shopify web shop will be a, a purchaser and a customer. And once we go through my process, do the research, fine tune the positioning and messaging and offer stack, we're able to increase on average from 1% to 2.5%. So that's a significant difference in terms of conversion, sales, profit. And then with further testing and iterating, we can then step up to 3% and over that. And just so you know, a benchmark of good would be over 2%. 1% would be average to poor and over... 3%, you're in the range of, you're starting to get into the range of great. And there are some clients I work with who are up to 8%, which is where you would see performance on Amazon, for example, and because they are so well optimized. So those are some of the benchmarks and some of the transformations that I help my clients with going through that process. Mm -hmm. Who's your typical client? Do you narrow down to a specific vertical or it's a wide spectrum? It is a wide range. So I do work with everything from drinks and food brands to health and wellness and fitness services. But I've also worked on car companies and enterprise technology services. So there's such a spectrum. And that's just because I've been doing this for a really long time. I started working in the industry three decades ago. So I've worked with all kinds of brands and companies. And my focus these days is the mid-sized companies. And I also do work with some enterprise brands. They seem to have the most appetite to grow in our current market which is more competitive and there's less budgets. So companies are having to do more with less. And mm -hmm. that's really why someone like myself who brings the framework and the set of experiences and the benchmarks can help companies with success and in today's market, which is tougher. So you do need that rigor and, and the frameworks really help a lot. Yeah. Awesome. Being an entrepreneur yourself and assisting others, it's much easier to relate and know exactly what they're going through. And I love what you're doing. I think it's a lot of empowerment and fulfillment, assisting somebody taking things to the next level. So yeah. how should one find you if they choose to reach out to you? I'm going to include the links below this video. I'll make sure the team includes those. Can you share? Yeah. So noahkoff.com which is N-O-A-H-K-O-F-F. -F. I have a free newsletter and that gives you tips and techniques and resources. And that's a great place to start where you can learn more. Uh, and I also offer groups and coaching experiences for one-to-one -one and groups. And I help my community with those offers and opportunities but you can get started with my newsletter and that's a great place to start. Awesome. I'll make sure those links uh, included uh, below this video. Thank no, thank you. you. Thank you for your yes. insight and uh, your perspective. It was very eye-opening for me specifically. I like the idea of understanding what the assessments bring out and it's not always reaching company goals. There's actually non-financial goals as well that uh, people still struggle even when they reach the uh, mid-level, enterprise-level uh, size companies. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed our conversation. I'll see you soon. Yes. Thank you, Noah.